Elon's greatest superpower, Tesla earnings, and the Elon and Twitter saga. Let's get started. Welcome to the weekly review. I'm Farzad Misbahi, and I'm looking forward to talking about my thoughts with you. So this is my forum where I sit down unedited, or I try not to edit, where I sort of do a brain dump of all the different things that I've thought about for the week. And for this week, I want to cover those three main topics that I talked about before in the intro, Elon's greatest superpower, Tesla earnings, and the Elon and Twitter saga. So before we even get started, I just got back from playing tennis with uh, Dave Lee. Some of you may know Dave Lee from Dave Lee on Investing. He covers a lot of the Tesla stuff, but we both live in Austin and uh, he asked me to go out and play some tennis with them. And I'm like, heck yeah, I'll go get my ass kicked. <laughs> and that was super fun. And yeah, if you're watching Dave, I had a blast, man. Thanks for inviting me out. Uh, I had a really good time. And if you guys are interested in seeing uh, our little impromptu chat that we had right after the game about Tesla and some other things as well, uh, Dave has it listed on his Twitter account under at HeyDave7. Uh, and you'll have a link to view that video. So if you're interested, you can go check it out. So uh, for the first topic I want to talk about this week is the Elon's greatest superpower. So one of the comments that was left on one of my videos a few days ago, and I was literally trying to find this comment because I was thinking about it and I was trying to look for the comment so I can give the person credit and I can't find it. Sometimes the way YouTube has the comment section, it's very hard to parse through things. But if the person's listening to this, you know who you are. I'm sorry, I can't give you credit. But uh, it was it was an awesome comment, but it really got me thinking. So. Uh, this person said something along the lines that what he enjoys about the content that I make, which again is super sweet and I'm very humbled by by him saying this or, or her saying this or, or they saying this, is um, that I am somebody who seems to be uh, very attracted to ideas, not so much people or things, but ideas. And that was an interesting comment that really resonated with me because I've always thought about... Um, things in the world or or uh, things you can be interested in rather as binary it's either things or or people and uh, i've heard many people talk about this before where you know there, there are studies that have been done that show that certain people are more attracted to things where certain people are more attracted to people and for somebody to come out and say hey like it does seem like you're somebody who's really attracted to ideas more than those two things i was like yes you're 100 percent right that's totally the case and i never thought about that before which is weird right i'm always somebody that's in my own head always thinking about stuff and i didn't really make that connection where i find ideas or um sort of thought exercises or almost like daydreaming in a way and thinking about things and thinking about the future as more interesting for me than say, um, you know, being super curious about an individual person or being super passionate about an individual thing. Now I do enjoy things and I do enjoy people. I definitely do. I'm married. I love my wife to death and I super, uh, I want her around. I really enjoy her company, but ultimately the idea thing is what really stuck out to me. And I somehow started thinking about this within the context of of an Elon Musk, okay? And the reason I was thinking about him is because of the recent Tesla earnings that have happened. Um, obviously, he's at front of mind, and I was constantly thinking about, okay, so what's, what's the future entail? I made a few videos about, uh, really, I made a video that reacted to that earnings report. But I think I finally figured out, at least in my own head, and somebody else could have already said this, but in my own head, I think I finally figured out why Elon has so much um, so much attention from so many people and why his appeal, at least for the for the recent time, if you really think about the last year or two, there's been a transformation where more and more people are really warming up to Elon as a person, um, Elon as a business maker, Elon as a product maker and Elon as somebody who thinks very grandiose and has very far uh, far into the future ideas, okay? And it finally clicked for me. I'm like, okay, now I understand why Elon is entering this phase where there's more and more people that seem to really gravitate to him. And it's those three things. There are many people on this planet who are very interested in people. 
there are very many people on this planet planet who are interested in things and there's many people on this planet that are interested in ideas and elon somehow encapsulates all those three things very strongly so let's go through it as an example okay so the people portion elon is somebody who's extremely wealthy elon, elon is somebody who has a lot of notoriety He's a very interesting person. Um, he He's somebody that I think is viewed uh, by the general public who are really thinking about him as a person, about how inspiring he is, his work ethic, uh, his leadership skills, his quirkiness, right? When he's on stage and he, he obviously is not a public speaker, but he still wants to be out there delivering the message. Um, you know, he, he's a troll. <laughs> he makes jokes on Twitter, especially. And and he seems like somebody, you know, he, of course, he has a certain aura around him of, of I guess, greatness or whatever you want to call it. But he does, he's not afraid of coming across unpolished. And I think that's very important to a lot of people. And people tend to gravitate towards him because of that. So that's the people aspect. So the people that are really find people as the most interesting things in their lives, which is completely fine. They gravitate to Elon because of that. Then the things aspect, right? There are people out there that love things. They love physical things. They love things they can touch. They love things that they can play with. They love things that they can make or dissect or break down or they love things they can drive or interact with in some way, right? So there are people out there that are fascinating with with things that uh, exist physically. And now Elon is somebody who's building these insane products, these insane things. You have the rocket, <laughs> the Falcon 9, which is reusable. That's an incredible thing that's happening. You have Starship, which is this incredibly gigantic rocket that's going to enable us to hopefully one day move to Mars and create a colony there and dramatically lower the cost of space, which God knows what other things we can get out of there. So that's the thing aspect. He has Tesla. He has these incredible cars that people are really passionate about. And uh, it's no secret that Tesla owners are by far one of the happiest, if not the happiest owners of any product, uh, maybe outside of some, uh, you know, say uh, Apple or other products, but definitely cars, right? So they make incredible cars. And then he's also working on these other things. He's working on Boring Company. He's working on Neuralink, right? You got the solar panels. You got the bot coming down the, the, the pike, right? So on and so on, so on and so forth. So an engineering um, prodigy, <laughs> I guess is the best way to, to call Elon. And that's yet another thing that people are very passionate about. How many people have you met that have thought about Tesla or Elon and they're like, wow, man, his cars are, so I want a Tesla one day, right? I want a Tesla one day. I really like the car. I really like the rocket. He's doing incredible things. Those are people that are very interested in things. And that's why they are attracted to Elon because of his things, okay? And lastly, which I, I, maybe I put myself in this camp and I'm not saying one is better than the other. I'm just saying it appears that's how human beings um, tend to sort of form in some way over time. One is not better than the other. They just are. They are attributes of a human being. The last one is the ideas, right? And so why is Elon somebody who uh, is a gravitational force for people that really enjoy ideas think about his grandiose sort of um goals for humanity okay move the planet to a sustainable energy future that's a amazing idea it involves things and it involves people but it's an idea right colonizing mars and going uh having humanity go out towards the stars another incredible idea right? Th these are things that are so large in scope, but they're very, they're very motivational. You know, it, it brings awe to the person if they believe it, if they're really like myself, if there's somebody that's really interested in ideas, okay? Um, you think about those things and then take other ideas as well that he has, you know, thinking about the future and AI, AI safety, the potential of AI, living in a and a future of plenty, right? And in the in the age of abundance, as he calls it, with the bot and other AI developments, that's another incredible. It's an idea. 
It's a thing. It's a thing that he wants, not necessarily a thing, but an idea. <laughs> it's an idea that he wants to create for the future. And the people that are very interested in ideas are attracted to that side of Elon. And so that's, that's I think, his superpower, his greatest superpower, is that he has those three things, the ability to attract people that are really passionate about people, attract people who are passionate about things, and attract people who are passionate about ideas, all three of those kinds of people find very strong attributes within that specific segment in him. And I think that's why his recent sort of um, rise in culture, you know, like he's getting a lot more attention and it's very clear. Uh, and the people he's getting attention from is diverse, right? It's a very diverse crowd. I think is going to be incredibly important for him for the future as he starts getting more and more pushback, the more he disrupts the industries that he's taking a part of, right? And I think this is where this is where it's really like subconsciously I knew this. You know, if you go if you go on the news, pick a random, you know, maybe outside of like far left uh, media outlets. But um, the thing that shocked me is like, for example, Fox News, um, you know, I'm not a huge news guy. I just I'd really stay away from news, to be completely honest. But if something comes up that seems interesting to me and I click on, it, I don't really care where it's from. I click on it just to see what they have to say. But yeah, places like CNBC. Fox News, um, not so much CNN or MSNBC. I haven't seen it, but there's different crowds that you wouldn't ha that were either initially um, very anti Elon in a way, especially CNBC and the way they were trashing Tesla for the longest time, or Fox News that seemed to completely ignore him or sort of painted him in a way that seemed like he's some sort of you know left uh, person that you know their crowd. Uh, the, 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 the type of demographic you're trying to hit doesn't really fit that. So, um, but at least these two networks appear to be much more, uh, they're singing his praises in a lot of different ways. And this Elon and Twitter dynamic that's been going on as of late, especially uh, in places like Fox News, I've noticed a very positive view towards Elon. And that's an idea thing that I think is taking hold, you know, Again, using idea as an example, Elon's free speech um, battle, right? The thing that he's trying to really try and propagate. That's another thing that I'm really noticing. And when I went to Gigafactory, Texas, I talked about it before. Um, there were so many different kinds of people from so many different walks of life and backgrounds that were all under one roof celebrating this mission of Tesla opening a new factory and, you know, becoming a business hub of innovation and engineering in in central texas and people there uh i would say a lot of them were interested in the ideas that elon has but they're also very interested in the things he's making and who he is as a person okay that in my opinion is elon's greatest superpower and in my opinion, his greatest asset for the next for the next decade, I think his engineering engineering brilliance is absolutely should be lauded, and his leadership skills and the way he carries himself in a way that he leads by example should also be lauded, and the way he thinks about the future and the ideas he's got should also be lauded. But the fact that he has those three things, I think, is really the 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 thing that Elon has that very few people have or nobody has or appears that no one has at his level. OK, it's pretty amazing. It's pretty amazing. And I would love to hear from you if if what do you think about that? You know, I would love I want this to be these videos to be very open forum style. So. Uh, I might be asking questions or I, there are things that I'm thinking through that maybe are not fully fleshed out, but I would love to hear from you in the comments. And obviously let's use the comments section very respectfully to have a conversation about this, but I would love to hear your thoughts about this too. Like what are other things that you're thinking about as far as um, what his really greatest asset is and how this plays into the future of his companies and sort of his missions, you know? And the one thing I want to be really careful of is that 
it's very easy to sort of fall into this rabbit hole where you get so passionate about a specific person or idea or thing that you become really blinded to what is actually going on. And so what I'm always trying to do, and I'm trying really hard to do, is to be as level-headed about this as possible. Because you can see how easy it could be if somebody is uh, has those abilities, how easy they can become a person where the people that are following you potentially could see you doing no wrong, okay? And I'm not saying that Elon is a person that is doing bad things. I, I think the opposite. And... I can, I'm pretty sure that his intentions are very good, especially for the long term. But at the same time, I'm also aware of the fact that if a person that has those attributes is a very, very powerful person, really powerful person. Okay. But I'm just, I'm just thinking about that. I think it's worth highlighting. I think it's worth talking about. What does that mean? Right. It's unique. <laughs> at the very least, it's extremely unique. But yeah, what do you think? What do you think about that? It, it seems pretty wild, right? It seems pretty freaking crazy. So next topic, we'll cover the Tesla earnings. Um, I did a video about this on Thursday, uh, the day after earnings came out and an obvious beat everywhere, uh, at least against consensus. After my talk with Dave earlier today after tennis, he made a great point that, you know, the reason why it doesn't seem like it's way higher against where it was from a stock price perspective is that it's sort of the, the people that are the stock, the people that own the stock were expecting really good earnings and they got really good earnings. And that is primarily why you haven't seen this explosion in stock price. At the same time, we have macro events around Jerome Powell talking about a 50 basis point increase in the interest rate, which is obviously causing some havoc in the market. But ultimately, the earnings were incredible. And the things that were big highlights was gross margin for the cars, 32.9%, if I remember correctly, operating margin of 19.2%. The operating expenses went up only 200 million per quarter from Q1 2021 to Q1 2022. So I believe it was 1.6 billion, it went up to 1.8 billion, but their income went from 600 million to 3.6 million. So they added $200 million of operating expenses, yet they added $3 billion <laughs> of cash, basically. Crazy, crazy numbers, right? The thing that I'm looking for after this report into the coming weeks is as Ford GM, Stellantis, Mercedes, BMW, whatever other uh, car companies start reporting their earnings, VW, Volkswagen, I'm curious to see, A, how they perform. Uh, I don't think they're going to perform great because a lot of these legacy automakers are down, you know, anywhere between 15 to 25% uh, Q1 versus Q1 of previous year. So the year after sort of, the, sort of the worst supply chain issues that car manufacturers were having, in my opinion, they're, they're down big time, okay? So... That can't be good for earnings. It just can't be good for earnings. So I'm very curious to see how, as those uh, companies start reporting what they look like. And what I expect will happen is that all these car companies are going to report poor earnings. They're not going to report good, good earnings. And it's going to become clear that Tesla is going to be the company that's going to generate the most profits in the year by far. By far. Like, by far. And so the whole story about... Tesla being a growth story, uh, a, a company that is really people are buying the stock for its future potential that, you know, if you buy Tesla stock, you're not really buying it for what it's doing now. You're buying it for what it's going to do in five years. I'm curious to see if that narrative is going to completely change this quarter. Now, it might be optimistic of me to think that's going to happen, but I think the precedent is set for that to happen. If you have a quarter where Tesla is the only car maker that's actually making money and making a lot of it at that, and no one else is making any money, or they're making way less than they were 
during the COVID supply chain craziness, then what does that mean for the future? What does that mean for the future? Will, will the narrative, will the public sort of discourse kind of change around Tesla as a, not only a future potential company, but also a current generator of ridiculous cash and profits? Will that change? Okay. And then you think about the longer term implications of that. So what if we're in a situation where GM and Ford and all these other car companies are struggling for the foreseeable future from a profitability perspective on a quarterly basis? If they already can't get enough gas cars out the road, uh, out their line, out of their factories, either because of supply chain issues or demand issues, at this point, it's sort of irrelevant. Okay. Those factories require a certain number of units to be pushed through the factory for that factory to be profitable. You have all these sunk costs, all these fixed costs that are in the factory that are going to hit your profitability. Okay. And so in the case of Ford, they might need to run X number of cars uh, per quarter. I don't know. I'm just going to make up a number. A million. They need to run a million cars per quarter to be profitable. But because of supply chain issues, they're only running at 800,000 or 850,000. It doesn't matter how much you try and raise the, the price by. After a certain point, you're going to price out customers who are, who are starting to understand that the product you're selling is becoming obsolete. Okay? So you already have one problem of people starting to understand that electric vehicles are going to be the future of cars. And so you're starting to get the shift. I had a friend that came up to me who is a huge gearhead. He loves cars. He owns a BMW uh, 3 Series. I think it's an M. Anyway, really nice car. Sounds great. <laughs> it's a beautiful car, gas car. And for the longest time, he was somebody that was saying, you know, I, I, you know, Teslas are cool, but I'm going to miss the noise. You know, I'm not going to, I'm not going to really look into a Tesla. I just like the noise. I like the driving dynamic of a gas car. Great. Cool. Last time I saw him, he's like, I'm really thinking about getting a Tesla. I'm like, why? He's like, well, you know, my lease is running up and it just seems like the value proposition is better for Tesla. And if gas cars are going away anyway, why would I want to buy a gas car? or lease a gas car when I'm going to be stuck with something that is going to be obsolete potentially in a few years? And I said, great question. <laughs> great question. So that that started to happen from somebody that was very squarely, at least for the last few years in the camp, in my opinion, correct me if I'm wrong, person who's listening, I'm not going to say your name, but you know who, exactly who you are, um, who changed his mind, who I didn't expect for that person to change their mind, let's say for at least another couple of years, but that's already happening. So what that's telling me is that there is a shift already happening probably way faster than these legacy automakers want it to happen. And on top of that, you have a supply chain issue that they're struggling with that Tesla doesn't seem to be struggling with that is going to not even allow them to get the profitable cars that they're making in the gas cars out their doors forget the EVs. We already know that these car companies cannot make money on EVs from the get-go. Look at Tesla. Okay. How long did it take Tesla to become profitable with their EVs? Like truly profitable while they were scaling their company. It took them 12 years, 10 years. I'm doing this math very wrong. No. Yeah. Because the Roadster came out in what? 2009. If I remember right, 2010, let's, let's call it eight to 10 years. Talking about eight to 10 years to become consistently profitable under while ramping up their business and coming out with EV cars. And this is with them starting from scratch, starting from scratch with extremely good leadership, incredibly talented teams and cutting edge technology. Okay. In what universe will the legacy automakers be able to do that while they're facing an issue with their existing lineup where they can't even sell those cars because of either supply chain issues or demand issues. So you're taking away faster than they wanted. Okay. 
Because these car companies, I bet you, had a roadmap in their mind. It's like, by this by this time, we're going to transition to EVs, and we're going to have a nice curve downwards of the car, or of the gas car business, and we're going to have a nice curve upwards of the EV business. And we're going to have a little bit of pain in the middle, but it shouldn't be more than, say, maybe a year or two, and then we'll be back to profitability, no problem. We might be hurting, okay? So this is the gas curve they're thinking, and this is sort of the EV curve they're thinking, right? And then there's a little valley here. I, I can't draw, so forgive me. But what if the gas car just goes like this, and then you have an EV curve that's still supposed to be the way it is because it can only go so fast. Then you have this gigantic gulf that's happening in, the, in this area where in between the transition from gas to EVs, they're losing billions and billions and billions and billions of dollars. Okay. What is that going to mean for all those factories, for all the people working there? I've talked about this in my previous videos, but the, really the point I'm trying to make here is will the narrative finally change where the broader sort of population understands this and the media understands this and the mass media understand this? This is, hap this is going to happen. Like it's going to happen, you know? I'm not a fortune teller, but it's going to happen. And I know most, if not all of you already know it's going to happen. Okay. But everyone else needs to know this too. This shouldn't just be a Tesla thing that somehow we keep this to ourselves where we are, you know, that's not like we're trying to keep it to ourselves, but we shouldn't be the only ones that can see this coming. You know, everyone else needs to know this is coming. They need to know this is coming, especially the people that are working at those companies. You know, do we think that what percentage of GM or Ford's workforce agrees with this statement? If that, if that percentage is less than 20%, they're in gigantic trouble. If that number is higher than 20%, then theoretically they can take that 20% of the workforce and try to build consensus against the rest of the company. And hopefully that 20% is all in the leadership group so they can sort of figure out how to pass it down to the rest of the teams. So I'm curious to see if that narrative is going to change. I'm curious to see if we're going to get to a point where, you know, MSNBC and CNN and Fox and CNBC in the same manner where they were running sort of these uh, articles back in 2018 about Tesla, about how how imminent their failure was. I wonder if we're going to see the same level of attention given to really companies that are sometimes incredibly important to the to the uh, to the to that country's ability to function take germany as an example i had a guest on my podcast last week his name's jan and he's from germany and he was describing how these car companies in germany are incredibly crucial to that country's economy and the culture of that country, the, how they identify as people <laughs> in a way, okay? If those companies go away, what happens to Germany? What happens to Germany, right? If Ford and GM go away, what happens to the United States? The United States is probably going to be fine because guess what? They got Tesla, okay? But, man, I don't know. I don't know. That looks, that looks pretty, uh, pretty intense to me. And then the last topic I'll hit on this one as well is uh, Elon and Twitter. So some of the news we got uh, this week is that it looks like Elon's has put together a tender offer where, or at the very least, he secured all the funding where he is, I think, doing somewhere between 30 to 40% of the purchase out of pocket, essentially. And then the rest of it's going to be financed um, you know, or he's going to take out a loan against his shares or something where different banks are going to come in and help uh, Elon with the acquisition of Twitter. So what's really interesting there, that the thing that I learned, uh, I think a few weeks ago, as, as well as everybody here as well, that's listening to this, um, or if you haven't heard about this, <laughs> get ready. The board of Twitter basically owns nothing of Twitter. If you remove Jack, who's the founder of, of, of Twitter and was the CEO until, the, until Parag took over, company uh 
The rest of that board, I think, owns way less than 1% of the company. Okay. In what universe can a company function well if the board of a company doesn't have any skin in the game? What's the purpose of the board at that point? What incentives do they have to preserve their investment? Why would you have a board <laughs> that owns almost nothing of a company? What happened? I would love to hear. Does anyone know what happened? What happened? How did we get here? I told my wife about this. My wife's like, I can't believe that's legal. Like, what do you mean? She's like, I can't believe it's legal for a public company to have a board whose board doesn't have to own a piece of the company that they're a board of. I'm like, huh? That it makes sense. I mean, I don't know. I don't know if it should be illegal, but you know, it just it's just a very like how in the world? How in the world did like what are the dynamics of boards that even allow them to get to that point? You know, it's wild. I think maybe I shouldn't say this. No, I'll say it just because I'm trying to get into the habit of just speaking my mind and being comfortable with it. I think Jack. Um, ha heading two different companies, Twitter and Square, I think having his attention in two different places probably wasn't the greatest thing for Twitter because then sort of Twitter, if you have certain folks in a company that's large enough and those folks are given enough power or influence and those people don't have the best company's interests in mind, they will turn the company into something that serves their own that serves their own self interest, either it be status, power, a salary, whatever. But is it good for Twitter? Okay. And I don't want to pass judgment on Jack. I actually do really like him as a person, but I wonder if a little bit of what happened there is that Jack just was a little bit too distracted between the two. You know, or I don't know. There could be other things that happened too. Maybe. Maybe he put people in leadership positions and perhaps they turn on him in some way and somehow he lost control of the company. I have no idea. I have no idea. But um, it's a bummer. It's a bummer because I do really respect Jack quite a bit and he's created an amazing platform. But the ones that are running it are not really taking it to its full potential and it's clear that's the case. And so that's what Elon wants to do, which is super cool, obviously. And yet again, I think that's another example of where Elon is incredibly good at uh, handling multiple things at once, right? He, uh, SpaceX, Tesla, boring company, Neuralink, uh, blah, 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 down the list you go. All those companies seem to be working really freaking well. <laughs> they seem to be going really, really, really well, okay? It's hard to do. It's really hard to do. So I'm curious to see where this goes. I would be, what's the most interesting dynamic for me is that Tesla has offered uh, $54 a share, essentially. The stock was basically at 38 bucks before he came out as a large investor of Twitter, the, the largest single stockholder of Twitter. Um, so that's how many dollars? $16 on top of the value of Twitter. It went up, it basically went up, call it 40%, 30, 40% since uh, he came out with, with news came out of his um, purchase of uh, Twitter shares. So if the board rejects that offer and the board doesn't have any skin in the game in the company, what are the investors gonna do, right? And there's obviously a lot of news and talk about the dynamic between what's gonna happen here between the investors and the board. If the board, turns down the offer in some way, could there still be like a back alley way to get with the investors? And then the investors are really the ones that have power of the company. So could they overthrow the board or say, board, you're just, you don't know what you're talking about. We're going to take this offer, take it private, please. Please make it into something better so we can actually, you know, g give us give us the profit, let us get out. You can have the company. And then Elon goes and figures out what to do with it. So super interesting dynamic. Very excited to see what happens. And yeah. Maybe we'll get some fireworks next week. Maybe we'll get, maybe maybe they'll accept the offer next week and then it, it, it's taken private. And then Elon becomes uh, the uh, essentially the largest stakeholder of Twitter. And then we'll start seeing changes in Twitter overnight. Boom, 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 boom. That should be fun.
that should be fun. Anyway, we'll wrap it up here. Thank you very much for stopping by for the weekly review. I believe this is the fourth one I've done. I can't remember. You'll find out in the title once you click on it, which one this is. And yeah, let me know. Let me know of the format. I'm still trying to mess around with it. I do want to keep it without any edits because I, I think I need to practice my train of thought in front of the camera. And uh, this is good for me to do that. So apologies if it's uh, a little bit tough to listen to, but uh, you know, I really appreciate it if, if you've made it this far. And of course, I really appreciate everybody here. Uh, if you have any comments or questions about what you've heard, please drop them in the comment section below. Uh, I love it when the comment section turns into a lively debate or a lively place for people to throw out ideas and think about ideas and sort of trying to figure out how to tackle certain things that we've discussed as a group. Please keep it respectful. Um, definitely, I think the community that's being building around my channel has been extremely respectful and super kind and sweet. So I really thank you guys for that. Honestly, I do. Thank you so much. And um, I do notice th the spam bots from time to time. Please ignore them. Uh, Better yet, report them if you can. Report them as spam so that YouTube can somehow figure this. Like, it's literally the worst thing ever. <laughs> these, these like, YouTube spam comment bots or whatever. I do have a, a, a code that... Python code that I got from uh, Linus Tech Tips, which is a YouTube. Somebody, some genius sat down and put together a Python script that essentially goes... I have to manually sort of push it, but... If I start seeing spam comments in my comment section, I go in this thing, and then this thing, uh, you know, goes through my last say thousand comments or ten thousand comments, and then starts uh, deleting and banning accounts that it's obvious that's obviously spam, and it's done an extremely good job of catching those comments. So, um, hopefully, YouTube figures that out. I would argue it's worse than the Twitter bot mess that Twitter has. The YouTube spam comments are a pain in the ass, and I really hate them. So YouTube, please, <laughs> please, please. Anyway, uh, thank you very much for watching. If you want to, if you like what you, if you enjoy what you listen to or saw, throw me a like. It helps the YouTube algorithm pushes out to more people. Uh, if you want to subscribe, that's awesome as well. If you want to support the channel in any way, I have a link to my Patreon in the description below. I also have, uh, you can also join the channel by clicking on join right below this video. There's a button for it and you get a cool badge if you want to do that. And then uh, lastly, I have a link, a uh, special link for, with Athletic Greens uh, for a special deal. And Athletic Greens is a supplement that I use every single morning. I really trust it. Uh, it's something I've been using for months now, and it truly has made my digestive health better, and I just feel better overall. So if you're curious about the product or in the deal, click on that link. I get a little bit of a cut in the back. So thank you very much for doing that. Uh, and yeah, thank you very much. Have a great weekend. We'll see you next week and have fun. Have a good time. Take it easy. Bye-bye.